get y'all to hate me off the bat uh, this morning. So, anyways, how many of you were at camp? I think I recognize. There we go. Let me see. I need to. Uh, here we go. Uh, at camp. I got a picture of. Is it sincere? Is that your name? I got a picture of you and. Is it jo- no, you and Travis. When y'all had that pile or whatever. Um, their their team name was the Stinking Awesome Heifers. I don't know who came up with that, but I liked it. <laughs> So I had a picture of them pointing to this thing. You came up with that? Oh my goodness! And then I and then and then I had a picture of Joe. It was Garcia, I think it is. Joe had a picture of that deer butt story that I told. And so he, he, they got some extra points from me at for being the preacher for camp, uh, for having that deer that deer butt on there. But uh, but man, I'm not awake yet either. How many of you like me? You still sleep? I lost two hours, and that is man. I flew, of course, from home yesterday and I lost an hour coming east and then I lost another hour and my wife woke up this morning she was texting me and and she said man I'm still tired I said I don't want to hear about it this morning <laughs> usually she's the one she's up at 4 30 every morning she's a public school teacher I don't know if you knew that uh, but she's a public school teacher uh, teaches fourth grade and did teach special ed and then teaches fourth grade and normally she's up at 4 30 every morning 4 35 o'clock I'm an evangelist so I wake up at the crack of noon every so when I get asked to teach Sunday school, it's rough. And so y'all pray for me this morning. But I trust the Lord's going to give us a good meeting. I'm excited to meet Kenny Baldwin. And uh, I've never met him before. Everybody in their grandma has asked me, do I know Kenny Baldwin for the last, you know, five or ten years? And I'm like, listen, just because I'm black, I sing and I play the piano. And uh, I'm going to tell him tomorrow. I, but I had, I had an old, old uh, white guy come up to me in Tennessee. At uh, Brother Tony Hudson's church, he called me. He said, "He said, excuse me, young man. He said, are you Kenneth Baldwin?" And I'm like, "Oh my goodness!" And I, so I asked him if he was Lester Roloff. <laughs> Anyways, you say Lester Roloff's been dead for tw- 30 years, exactly. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Man, I'm gonna get to the Bible sometime in here. But uh, if you can't tell already, I can, I enjoy church. I love church. I love God's people, and uh, I. I I even I even like deacons, amen. And uh, I don't know if you have any, but keep them away from me. But uh, good, okay. No, but uh, I do I do love church and uh, love revivals. I preach mostly revivals. I enjoy I enjoy preaching camps and, and things like that. I don't preach a lot of them, but I'm preaching more. Probably the last three or four years, I've been preaching more uh, camps than I have. And of course, I'll be back um, this year at High Point Ambassadors, whatever they call it. But I'm coming back the second week this year, so I'm gonna miss your church and. And miss you, young gentlemen. But I, I appreciate you. Appreciate your uh, your spirit and your response to the preaching. But I love revivals more than anything. I preach more revivals during the year than than almost about anything. Uh, Romans chapter eight. And when I learned that your name was sincere, I thought, man, that's a cool name right there. Like you read, I, I met a young lady and I was in uh, Iowa. Her name was Outrageous. <laughs> And I don't mean it was outrageous. I mean outrageous was her name. And uh, she got she got saved, and then her brother got saved. And I was like, "What's his name? Ludacris?" Anyways, uh, <laughs> whew, I thought she was related to that rapper. Um, but her her name was outrageous, and and uh, she had a, a rough home life. But she had I mean she had the bluest hair I've ever seen in my life. And uh, so I thought it was shaved completely on. The, I mean it was as short as mine is on the side, and she had a kind of a ponytail at the top of that thing, and. And uh, I asked the preacher, I said, what's that girl who got saved? I said, what's her name? He said, oh, her name's outrageous. I was like, yeah, but what is it? You know, I was like, no, it's outrageous. And then her brother got saved, and, and I'm going to tell you, they just got on fire. And their, their daddy, I guess, the year before had taken his own life, and, and uh, she had found him. And, boy, just a tough situation. Uh, but God's grace was all over them, and, and uh, they were getting saved. And I think their mom got saved. And, uh, boy, what a, what a wonderful testimony it is to how God can use that young girl. Um, he can use outrageous people, amen. And if you saw my life before I got saved, you'd say you, my name probably should have been outrageous. But I thank God for His grace. Thank God for His mercy. I want to help you this morning. I just want to kind of warm it up, and and uh, this won't be on revival. I'm sure I'll preach something on the subject of revival, and and this morning I'll preach a little bit in the morning service. But I want to help you. Uh, we live in a day and an age. Well, let's read Romans eight twenty eight, and we'll keep our finger in Romans eight twenty eight. The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate. Now, I, despite my name Calvin, I'm not a Calvinist. Okay, uh, God does not predestine people to hell and predestine some. According to the Bible, they are predestined, look at this, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he them he also called. And then we called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. And of course, it goes on here and, and talks about separating us from the love of God. I really want to hone in on verse number 28 and some of the verses before in this chapter. But the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I want to talk to you this morning for the next 20 minutes or so on why God's children suffer. Why God's children suffer. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning from the word of God. And Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, help me as uh, for my mind to be clear. You know, uh, there's there's been several time changes. And and Lord, I don't want to I don't want to take away from your word because of my mind or my body being tired. God, I pray that you would help me. Lord, I need your spirit. Uh, Lord, if I've ever needed you before, I need you now. And Father, I pray that you would from the top of my head to the sole of my feet set me apart for your purpose this morning. I yield myself to your spirit. Lord, I want to say everything you want me to say, and I don't want to say anything you wouldn't have me say. And uh, Lord, may your word be magnified. May Jesus be glorified. And may we say it has been good to be in the house of the Lord when it's all said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a day and an age where there are some questions being posed to Christians that are, that are some very difficult, difficult questions to answer if we're not prepared. There's a new wave of atheism. There's a new wave of secularism that is facing. And if you have not, and you'll understand it when I when I start asking you some questions in a minute here, and I'm not expecting you to answer them, but you'll understand what I mean. Some of these questions that we're hearing from whether it's public school or whether it's uh, out in the world or whether it's online, uh, these questions are being posed uh, to Christians. And, and if we're not careful, we're going to allow the seeds of doubt that Satan can throw into our hearts and lives to cause us to quench anything that God wants to do in our heart and cause us to even doubt the very existence of our God and Savior. Now, if the Lord lives inside of you, listen, you, you have no doubt of that. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, bears witness with our spirit. That's actually in earlier in chapter 8 here where he talks about his spirit bears witness with our spirit and we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. But his spirit is witnessing inside of us that he is real. But if we're not careful, God, that Satan will bring something into our lives or something into our view to get us to doubt our God. I believe one of the things that God has given me in the, in the revivals that I'm preaching is to get God's people to believe God again. Because if we have God's people that do not believe him and we say we trust him for our never dying soul, but we can't trust him to get us through the heartaches and get us through the trials of life and we can't trust him to make it to tomorrow. We can't trust him to overcome and break the chains and shackles of addiction in our life. And we can't trust him to, to give us the ultimate victory in our life. Listen, we've, we've got to start believing God again. And we've got to start trusting him again. And by the way, that's what revival starts. Revival starts believing that God can send us revival. Uh, David played with God. He said, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice? And, and he said, listen, you've got to believe. The Bible says he that cometh to him must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The Bible says it is without faith, it is impossible to please him. It doesn't say improbable. It doesn't say it's hard to do. It says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we get asked questions often. Maybe you've heard a question like this. If God was real, why did that happen? If God was real, why are little babies in Africa starving right now? If God was real, why, didn't that, why did that happen to me? Why didn't he stop that from happening? The new atheists today, they'll say something like this. Either, either, and they'll bring up some heartache that happened in your life, and they say, either God doesn't know, God doesn't care, or he can't do anything about it. Either God doesn't know, which wouldn't make him God, God doesn't care, which wouldn't make him the God of the Bible, or he can't do anything about it. He has no power to do anything about it. 
But Alan, if God was really real, then why are evil people in power? But Alan, if God's really real, then why is the little kid who's never done anything in his life to anybody over in a city like Aleppo in Syria, and they're being napalmed and they're having uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction unleashed on them, why would God allow that to happen? Or why isn't he doing anything about it? I mean, if God was really real, couldn't he have caused those airplanes on September 11th, uh, uh, 2001? Couldn't God have done something about that? And could God, couldn't God have, you know, stopped them or, or something, you know, uh, provide some way that it wouldn't have happened before? If God was really real, Brother Allen, would that have happened? And these questions are posed to us. Uh, can I say to you, if somebody comes to you with that kind of question, let, let me say this primarily. Don't ever let somebody stand on the platform of Christianity and argue against Christianity. Here's what I mean by that. I had a man one time who was an atheist. I was talking to him. And he said, he said, I don't believe in God. He said, I just don't, I just don't believe in God. And I said, sir, and after a bunch of discussion, I said, sir, you know what? I said, I don't believe in dentists. I don't believe in dentists. Not at all. He said, because he, he said to me, he said, man, well, he said all this suffering's going on in the world and these kids and, and he brought up Africa and, and these kids in Thailand. And by the way, there's some tragic stories. And these these young men over in India and, and in Pakistan are literally sold to to perverts to abuse them. I, I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I heard a story one time about a young lady who was in India and she was sold. Her mom and dad had died and she was sold by her aunt into into sex trafficking and was used and abused, and she was going to live in this four-block radius where men would come there and abuse her and, and, and for a little bit of money that she could survive on. And, and I thought, man, what a tragic story. And he was bringing up things like this, and I thought, man, uh, what, a, what a tragic story. And he said, all this stuff going on, Brother Allen, how can I believe in a God who would allow this suffering to take place? I said, well, sir, I said, I don't, I don't believe in dentists. I said, You're, I said, if dentists were really real, There'd be no such thing as cavities in this world. If dentists were really real, I mean, there'd be no such thing as dentures or gingivitis or, or bad breath, and, and there is. And uh, there'd be no such thing as, I, I greeted some of y'all this morning, and uh, I, 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 thought about, I thought about once in a while just, you know, you know we used to have banaca, you know, that spray. I thought about, you know, there's been some people I fellowship with where I just want to say, brother, let me see your tongue. You know, and just run away from him. <laughs> and uh, why? Somebody's gonna get mad at me. Why? Why is it the people with the worst breath always want to talk the closest to you? You ever notice that? It's just like they always want to talk like right here. And I'm like, and, and it wouldn't it be nice just to throw one of those strips, you know, the breath strips right on there. But let me see. Your tongue doesn't look. You know, <laughs> you know, tried to choke him to death. Yeah, but I don't know where that came from. But anyways. But I said, man, I don't believe in death. I said, there wouldn't be bad breath. There wouldn't be gingivitis. There wouldn't be tooth decay. I mean, one time I got, I, I have one wisdom tooth removed. The one upper here. And uh, maxillary, you know, lingual. No. And uh, I have one tooth up here that got removed, my, my wisdom tooth. It hurt so bad one day. I was driving limousines uh, back in the day when I was still teaching at Christian school. I, in the summertime, I drove limousines. And I was driving this fellow from O'Hare Airport in Chicago all the way back home to Milwaukee. And it got so bad, I just about passed out by the time I get, got to his house. I literally put it in park at his house. I laid back, and the next thing I remember, his wife was helping, him and his wife were helping me out of the limousine into their house. They called, had to call the fire department and everything else. It was crazy. I mean, if there was really dentists in this world, there wouldn't be any tooth decay. There wouldn't be any pain that, that was going on associated with my wisdom tooth that almost got to the place where I crashed and, and passed out. I mean, if there was really dead, and he said, he said, Calvin, he said, that's ridiculous. He said, matter of fact, he said, if they would just go to the dentist, they could get some help. And then he got real quiet. And I just looked at him. Yeah, you know. Can I tell you, every suffering that has taken place in this world is not because of the God of heaven. It's because we have left the God of heaven. 
What is going on in this world today in the governments of this world and the countries of this world? There is suffering today because we have left him and we have left his ways. And let me tell you this morning, if we just get back to him and get back to his ways, it'd be amazing what kind of transformation could happen in our lives and in our neighborhoods and in our cities and in this world today if we just get back to the doctor, the great physician of our souls. Well, here's what we do. We allow these people that don't believe in him to stand on our principles and argue against God. Here's what I mean. Here's what they say. If there's a God in heaven, why is there suffering? Here's what I say. If there's no God in heaven, what does it matter? If there's no God, it doesn't matter what suffering is. I mean, if you're a, if you if you believe in evolution and you're a Darwinian and you you believe, I mean, it's just man, we're just a bunch of accidents and we just came here because of you know we, a bunch of uh, gas reactions and and I've I've been with some, a lot of teenage boys and I, I'm starting to believe that, but uh, and uh, a bunch of gas balls floating around, amen. but uh, I, listen, if all we are is a is a is a bunch of results of some cosmic accidents walking around here, what does it matter that they're suffering? Matter of fact, if you believe in the survival of the fittest, maybe those little kids in Africa should die because they're definitely not the fittest. Maybe it's a good thing that they're dying off. That's what we say about animals, don't we? The weakest part of the tri the, uh, the herds, they always get killed off by the predators. I mean, what, wouldn't it be a great thing that these people are dying off so we can have a strong, and by the way, that's what Adolf Hitler believed. That's why I began to exterminate the Jews first and the Africans were next and after them were the Asians. And by the way, if you're not a blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, Norwegian, you were, on the, you were on the kill list too eventually. That's what he believed. There's no purpose to any of it if there's no God. But if there is a God, then your suffering matters. If there's a God, their suffering matters. If you're associated with me at all, if you're around me for any length of time, you're going to discover one thing about me is I, I love the martial art of jiu-jitsu. When I'm at home, I teach four classes a week. And if I'm home for the full week, I, I train about seven times during the week. My instructor is actually, he's, he's the coach and uh, corner man for a lot of ultimate fighting champions of the past. And if you're familiar with the UFC, you know the name Johnny Hendricks. He was a, he was a champion for a while. My my head jiu-jitsu instructor was was his head coach when he was a world champion. I love it. But my first instructor was a man from Brazil. And here's what he used to say to me. Anytime you brought up God, he was like, oh, no, bro. I believe in energy. And I'm like, you believe in what? I believe in energy, bro. Surfing in energy. <laughs> and uh, I believe in energy. And I said, I do too. We have a name for that energy. <laughs> we call him God. No, 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 no. That's too religious. I believe in energy. And he left our gym and started his own gym a while later. And he came back and he left his belt at our gym, so I had to take it back to him. And the day I took it back to him, I said, I said, uh, he, he was ranting and raving to somebody else about all these issues going on and kids shooting kids and the gang violence in Milwaukee and the drug violence going on in Milwaukee. And, and uh, <laughs> he was just ranting about it a little bit. And I, I said, I said, hey, I said, won't that energy help? I said, just call him the name of energy. And I said, I said, listen, if there's no God, it doesn't matter. These kids kill each other. I said, it doesn't matter. But if there is a God, and I said, Jumar, this is why, this is why there's kids of precious. Because the God of the Bible says, every one of us is made in the image of Almighty God. And the reason why you're important, sir, is not because of your skills. It's not because of your looks. It's not because of your talent. It's not because of your mind. You are precious and you are important to God because you are his creation. And the Bible even said, listen, whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. God is for capital punishment. Because you are you taking life as you playing God and you hurting, you destroying the image of almighty God. And he said this, he said, 
he said, <laughs> and I began to talk to him, and, and I said, and I said, uh, I said, you know what you taught me about the Lord? I said, you didn't even realize you were teaching me this, but it, you understand this. Have you ever tried it or you ever wrestled or anything like this? If you get a guy who knows what he's doing, it doesn't matter what you do. He's going to win in the end. He's going to win. And I said, <laughs> five years ago when I started jujitsu, I said, it doesn't matter how, how aggressive I got with you. It doesn't matter how much I could muscle this out. It doesn't matter how much I could bench press at the time, which is more than I can actually do right now. He said, I said, it didn't matter what you did, what I did against you. I said, in the end, you knew more than me. You, you, your will was stronger than mine and you knew how to get it done and you were going to win. And I said, uh, his name is Jumar. I said, Jumar, it doesn't matter how much you fight God. It doesn't matter how much strength you put into it. It doesn't matter how much you deny his existence or his power to overcome. In the end, and he will win. And his eyes got about that big. And he was like, you need to put that on a video, and I need to rewatch what you just said. And all of a sudden, a couple months later, he started going to a church down about two miles from us. All of a sudden, on his Instagram and on his Facebook, he start putting Bible verses on there. All of a sudden, out of there, he talked about giving his heart to the Lord. He went from, I believe in energy, bro. To praise God. How'd that happen? Because he stopped looking over here saying, why is all this suffering here? Why is all this bad stuff happening? Why? And I said, why does it matter? There's no God. Listen, your, your grandma died. You losing your daddy. You, lose, you losing your mama. You using your, your grandpa, granddaddy. It doesn't matter if there's no God. It matters because there's a God. We allow them to say things like this. If, Eve, if, if, God, is, if God is real, then why do evil things happen? Why did that evil happen to me? Can I say to you, if there's no God, you have no way to measure evil. You don't even know what evil is without God. Because they're basing evil upon Christian principles. They're basing evil in this world on the principles that are already in the Bible. Listen, if you don't believe the Bible, then how, why is lying wrong? Why is stealing? If there, I mean, if there's no Bible and there's no God, then man, I should be able to shoot whoever I want to. I should be able to, I mean, I should be able to absolutely do whatever I want to do, and you can't tell me. <laughs> Here's what they tell us. Who are you to tell somebody who to love? Come on, you've heard it. Who are you to tell somebody who to love? I mean, they're a human being, and they're a human being. Who are you to tell that person who to love? And I said, one time we had, a, we had a girl in our church, and she was kind of, she went to a, one, a couple philosophy classes, so she thought she was pretty smart. And so she, she, she said, who are, you to, who are you to tell those people who to love each other? And I said, you're exactly right. But what you really mean is who is God to tell them who to love? He's only the one that invented this thing. That's all he is. But you've got a point. If there's no, we, we call it in fancy terms, it's objective moral truth. If there's nobody outside of us saying this is right, this is wrong, then basic, basically everything you do in life is just made up. It's just made up. Well, who are you to tell somebody who to love? You're exactly right. <laughs> Can we say that also between a 50-year-old man and a 12-year-old? I, I thought your philosophy was, who are you to tell somebody who to love? Well, I've always loved that. Well, maybe that 15-year-old's always been a pervert too. As long as he can remember, he's been a pervert. See, without God, our rules make no sense, and they usually lead to cruelty. And you're right. If I, if I made this up myself, then yes, you have, no, you have no obligation to follow the Bible. If I made it up myself, if I just said, you know what, I just think these are some good rules. Let's just throw them in the book, and, and let's do this. But if it came from God, then we've got a basis for right and wrong. 
if you don't believe, listen, if you don't believe in the God of the Bible, you have no basis. You can just make it up as you go. And by the way, if, if you get to make it up as you go and I get to make it up as I go, then why are you so offended at God? I saw one time this man, he was a street preacher. And he said, he said, he said, uh, uh, he, he, used, he, was a, he was a street preacher and he would stand up there and he would put a microphone down here. And any atheist that wanted to, he could, they could come up and say anything they wanted to into that mic. Ask any question they wanted to in that microphone. And they would. And this man came up one time and he just started ranting and, I mean, just vile against God of the Bible. That bunch of stupid fairy tale, that's a bunch of... Da, 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 da. And he went on and on and on and on and on. And finally that preacher just let him. He just let him talk. And then when he was done, the preacher said this. He said, sir, he said, can I ask you something? He said, it's Christmas time right now. Down at that mall over there, there's a Santa Claus. I mean, there's an old, fat, white dude. The people let their kids sit on his lap and ask him for goodies. Why don't you ever go and protest him? Matter of fact, he said in a few months, we're gonna, there's going to be some leprechauns and some pots of gold and a bunch of lucky charms and running around here. He said, why don't you go protest leprechauns? As a matter of fact, <coughs> a, few, a few months after that, a few weeks after that, he said it's going to be Easter. And there's going to be a bunny down at that same mall. And there's going to be a big bunny in there. And kids are going to, now listen, listen, I, I, I know we're not in like farm country right now. And, uh, it, it, but it's, I think Pennsylvania is like Wisconsin. Once you get outside of the cities, it's like pretty much all green and, and, uh, and uh, farms and stuff like that. Now, I know we're not in farm country right now, but listen, rabbits don't lay eggs, okay? <laughs> and, uh, if you get something round from a rabbit, it's not going to be good. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he said, but he said there's going to be an Easter bunny over there. He said that Easter bunny, kids are going to expect eggs coming from, an, from, a, from a rabbit. He said, why don't you go protest them? He said, man, all these fake th things out here and these bunch of myths that people around the world believe. He said, why don't you go protest them? And that atheist, in a moment of candor, before he could react, before he could think through it, he said this. He said, well, we know they're not real. It's like Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. You know why that atheist is fighting so hard? Isn't it amazing, Christian? The Bible says the fool has said in his, there is no God. I used to read that and just kind of pass it over, but then I paid attention to it one day, and I said, there's a reason why he says it in his heart. James says, from whence cometh wars, they come from inside of there. The reason why that person who's been doubting God or we've been doubting God is because there is a struggle going on on the inside of them. And that's why they have to fight so hard because the fool said it's long before a fool ever with his mouth will utter that there is no God. He has argued within himself. Why? Because the Bible says that which may be known of God is revealed in your heart from the creation of this world. They know there's a God. And that's why they have to write books about it. And that's why they have to argue against it. Why? Because something inside of their heart says, the Bible says the invisible things of this world are clearly seen from the, from the beginning of creation. Oh boy, I got to hasten because I think we're, I don't even know what time it is. All right. Uh, here are three reasons why we suffer. I got I to gotta skip uh, some things and just get right into this because I think I got about three, yep, three minutes. Here we go. Why we suffer. Number one. We are part of a fallen race and a fallen creation. Look at verse number, the Bible says, verse number 22 of chapter Romans chapter 8, verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. Why? Because verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. He, listen, he goes, you can go back farther, you can go back all the way to Romans chapter 1. When we knew God, we glorified him not as God, we became vain in our imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. We suffer because we are part of a, of a fallen creation of people. The Bible says, and we, listen, we can all go back to Adam and Eve. They were perfect, the Bible says, just like the Bible says Satan was perfect in his creation until iniquity was found in him. We can go back to Adam and Eve, and we saw a perfect creation. 
But the Bible says when mankind fell, the creation fell with mankind. God not only cursed the man, the Bible says God cursed the ground that the man was going to work in someday. And now all of a sudden, work is not work has to be, the Bible says a man is now satisfied by the sweat of his own brow. Now we have suffering in this world and we have to work. And by the way, women have travailed, the Bible says, in pregnancy because of the curse of sin. And you and I, listen, God is not in heaven having to can't, people all the time, say, you know, is God in heaven handing out cancer? God doesn't have to hand out cancer. We are part of a fallen group of people and our bodies are decaying. And the Bible says, we'll talk a little bit about it this morning service, I believe. And if the Lord uh, leads me to, allows me to preach the message, I think he wants me to preach this morning. The Bible says, listen, in this body, we groan. The Bible said, in this flesh, we shall have tribulation. Listen, you don't have a pain in your side and, and kidney issues because God hates you in heaven. It is because you are a fallen race of people. You're going to have tribulation. The Bible says man are born a woman is few of days and they're full of trouble. As the sparks fly upward, the soul of man is born to trouble, Job tells us. And listen, there's going to be trials and tribulations in this life. It is not because God hates you. It's because you are a part of a group. Listen, nobody's making it out of here alive. Unless you hear a trumpet sound, and we, I'd rather go that route. But you're not making it out of here alive. We get arthritis. We get heart disease after a while, long enough. And we get cancer sometimes. And, and we get, listen, we get a, a prop, man. The older I get, the more, you know, things are tightening up or turning loose. <laughs> it's like a bad, you know, uh, car job here. I mean, the wheels are falling off of this thing the older I get. But I'm telling you. We're part of a group of people in a creation that is fallen. And because we are fallen, there is a groaning in the creation. Number two, we suffer because of the results of our own sin. We suffer for the results of our own sin. Because God, God elected to give us something called a free will and in that will one time a man said to me he said uh he said uh we were in limousine company and there was another man who's our missions director i got him a job there and he said uh there was one of the fellows i said he said he said how do you know matt and i said oh he, we go to church together he at the time he's a youth pastor i said he's a youth pastor and i'm the music director of the church and he said, oh, and he's yelling at me from halfway across the, limo the, the limousine garage. He said, oh, so you believe smoking's a sin then? And I said, no, it's just stupid. And he was like, okay, he got that real quick. You know what? God didn't have to hand out cancer. He will allow you to exercise your own will but he will also not rescue you from the results of your own will. If you want to sin and live a stupid life, listen, God's like, have at it. Have at it. If you want to talk like a fool, have at it. But every idle word which man shall speak, he shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. There's going to be results. But here, here's really, and I'm, I'm hastening right now, here's really what we suffer with. We suffer with living the results of other people's sin choices. Sometimes we don't mind so much living with the results of our sinful choices. Because most of us realize, yeah, okay, I, I blew it. I got stupid. But what about when we suffer because somebody else was stupid or sinful? Or wicked. That's a tougher suffering to take. God, why didn't you stop them? But I've counseled with people, tried to help people. And I mean some stuff you can't even fathom. You wouldn't want to fathom. Why didn't God stop them from doing that? My relative was killed, and by the way, I've, I've buried two cousins, both of them uh, 14 years of age, both shot in broad daylight. 
Why didn't you just stop? Couldn't God have stopped that bullet? Because I've heard about him doing it for other people. God, couldn't you have stopped the bullet from, from, from entering them? Couldn't you have them survive? Isn't it amazing? We want everybody else's will that affects us to stop. But when was the last time we ever stopped and said, God, why didn't you stop me? Why didn't you stop me from sinning against that person? Why, why didn't you miraculously stop me? But we struggle with that. We, strug- we don't struggle with our own free will, but we sure do struggle with everybody else's, don't we? We suffer because of the results of sin. Our lives and the lives of others. We suffer sometimes because of the sovereign hand of God. There are some, the Bible tells us, that suffer. According to Job, God sometimes steps in. And I don't have time to get into it this morning, but the Bible says this, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, listen to this, are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed. God said, there's a purpose in my suffering. Listen to this. We read it earlier. I'm done with this. And we know, because here's what we do. We read a Bible verse like Romans 8, 28, and here's what we say. We know that all things work together for good. (laughs) It's going to work out, brother. And brother, I, I believe that. But the Bible didn't stop there. Because here's what we do. We say all things work together for good. And then we say, well, Brother Allen, my, my, my mom was taken from me. How's that going to work together for good? We say, my, my wife and I, and I'll say a little bit about it maybe another time. When we, our first pregnancy, we lost that little baby. How's that going to work out together for good? How's it work out together for good when my former pastor of our church uh, goes on a, a, a Thanksgiving vacation with his family and, and ends up having a heart attack right there in front of everybody and losing his life? How's that going to work together for good? How's it work together for good when you have a young man who's gone from foster service to foster service to, fo- to abusive foster home? How's that work together for good? The Bible does not say all things are good. Don't miss that. The Bible does not say all things are good. Neither does the Bible just say all things work together for good, period. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. You know what that means, friend? If you don't love God, not going to work together for your good. Brother Allen, you, are you, what, are you, no, if you don't love God, it's not going to work for your good. But there's another part. To them that are called according to his purpose. How does it work? If you love the Lord enough to understand that he has a purpose for your pain, all things can work together for your good. I mentioned we lost that little baby. I would, I would, I would never wish that upon anybody. But there's a, there's a song that came out of that that I'll probably sing sometime this week and I'll mention the testimony of it. That is probably, I don't know if I will ever write a song that's more well known than this one. I've had several groups have recorded it. My quartet has recorded it. God has ministered. We sang, we, I don't have time to go into this, and, and then I wish I had our, I, another hour. Maybe I'll finish this some other time. We literally sang that song one time for 40 minutes straight at a youth conference. There's some young people got some help. We didn't even know in that youth conference, Brother Burden, that. There was a church there whose pastor had just taken his own life. I didn't know that. There's 90 teenagers from that church. I didn't know that. I didn't know that there were some kids there whose mother was dying of cancer and probably had about, I think, two days after they got back, died of cancer. I didn't know they were in the room. 
I didn't know there were women that whose husbands that loved him. I didn't know that. But I know this. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I want him to call me for whatever purpose he wants to call me for. And because of that, all things are working together for my good and for his glory. Father, we love you. Thank you for this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help me take that simple little thought. Why our children, why your children suffer. Sometimes it's because we're just a part of a fallen group of people. We're all going to 